from NJ.com. This is Talk is Cheap, a New York Giants podcast. We're talking big blue football all year round. Welcome, Giants fans, to episode 118 of the Talk is Cheap podcast, a New York Giants podcast here on NJ.com. I'm your host, Dan Duggan, and before we get the show started, uh, a few announcements. Obviously, I'm not usually the host of the show, so uh, first off, Joe Giglio, who did a wonderful job hosting this podcast for years. Fortunately for him, he got a job at WIP, which uh, prevents him from hosting this show, so uh, we will miss Joe, and I'll do my best, but I don't quite have the, uh, the radio chops that Joe has. And then also on uh, the NJ.com staff, we've had a little bit of a shakeup with James Cratch is now on the Rutgers beat, and Ryan Dunleavy is joining me on the Giants beat. He had been on Rutgers previously. Uh, you know, James did a phenomenal job with this. Uh, he helped me when I got uh, on the beat, kind of showed me the ropes. Uh, I know a lot of you fans really enjoyed him on the podcast. Even if you didn't always agree with what he had to say, you, you had to appreciate uh, his insight and his passion. Uh, but I think Ryan will step in and do a great job. I know Ryan from competing with him actually on the Rutgers beat when I first got hired by NJ.com in, in 2013. He was at the Asbury Park Press and and we went went head to head for a few years. So it's nice to finally uh, have him on the team. Uh, I think you guys really enjoy you know Ryan's perspective on things. So I'll just kick it over to Ryan real quick so he can just at least introduce himself and uh, and then we'll get into the news of the day. Thanks, Dan. Yes, same, man. Uh, looking forward to working with you. Looking forward to covering the Giants, obviously. Uh, covered Rutgers for probably – I went to Rutgers. I grew up in North Jersey. I went to Rutgers. I covered Rutgers for the student paper and then, you know, for Asbury, for the Home News Tribune, and then for us, the Star Ledger and NJ.com. Uh, enjoyed working with my buddy Keith Sargent over there. We made a good team, I'm sure. You and I will make a good team. Covered Rutgers for seven years. That's four years of Big Ten football. Went to some of the best, you know, football stadiums in the country. Uh, Really enjoyed that beat and, uh, you know, looking forward to covering the Giants, which I did a little bit in the Tuck and OC uh, locker rooms back in 2011, 2012. Actually, one of my first road assignments before I was even covering Rutgers was to go to the 2011 NFC Championship game out in San Francisco in Candlestick Park, which was a total dump in the <laughs> and it was po- the pouring rain. I actually think like the part the auxiliary press box I was sitting in, there was like rain leaking off the tent. Um, I, I was like, this can't be the NFL, right? <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, looking forward to it. I have a giant. I've covered Giants before, 11 and 12, and then I, I hopped on with you and Cratch at the end of this season. Uh, and it was a very different locker room is probably the best way to say it. So, uh, <laughs> so looking forward to what 2018 brings. Well, you'll be happy to know they have a new stadium for the 49ers. So we were just out there this year. I don't know when the next time we'll be back, but you shouldn't have any uh, flooding issues <laughs> next time we, we head out there. And hopefully the GPS takes you to East Rutherford, not New Brunswick. Those first couple of times we're out there for OTAs. <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, enough about the NJ.com changes because there are much bigger changes going on in East Rutherford. Uh, you know, the last time we had this podcast was right after Dave Gettleman came in with his, you know, his kick-ass message at the end of the season. Uh, and now Pat Shermer, uh, has officially been announced as the head coach. I mean, it was one of those open secrets how the NFL kind of always works at this time of year. Uh, we knew he was going to be the guy. Giants officially announced it on Monday. Um, so, I mean, we've had time to kind of process this news. Obviously, there's been a ton of content on NJ.com about Pat Shermer. Uh, but I think the the last taste that he left or the final audition he had didn't go so well. And, and, and Ryan was in Philadelphia. Um, so, I mean, listen, no one should make a judgment on a hire based on one game. I mean, he got that he got that offense to the NFC Championship game. And, and you look at that lineup, there wasn't a ton of superstars there. So uh, I don't think we should discredit him too much from, hey, Ran into a buzzsaw there in Philly, and Case Keenum kind of turned into a pumpkin. But, um, Ryan, again, you were there. I know you, you spoke to Pat briefly after the game. Just kind of curious, um, just your takeaways from, from that game and, and from talking to Pat. Yeah, I mean, so here's the number one thing I jotted down in my in my you know little reporter's notebook when that game was going on is that the Vikings went right down the field and scored right away. And they said on the 
Fox broadcast that that was five straight games that the Vikings scored on their opening possession. So I made a note of that. And actually, I asked Kyle Rudolph, the guy who scored the touchdown, the Vikings tight end about that after the game. And he gave all the credit to Shermer. He said, one of the most prepared people I've ever been around. And I think we all know coaches script their first whatever it is, the first drive, the first 10 plays, the first 20 plays. Everybody's a little different. Every play call is a little different. But uh, and he said the reason they've had so much success on those opening drives is because of the work Shermer does all week. So that's something I think Giants fans should want to hear. Uh, obviously, from there, they got shut out. So that's so that was the end. That was the end of the good news. Um, uh, some I mean, listen, uh, you like you said, Keenum threw 48 passes. I don't think any winning game plan Pat Shermer drew up included Case Keenum throwing 48 passes. So that's kind of a product of the def- the defense, which was the Vikings bread and butter fell behind. And that allowed the uh, you know, that allowed the Eagles to get get a big lead and kind of changed what Shermer wanted to do from talking to him afterwards. I thought he was a Giants football coach. Basically, he was uh, polite, respectful of the locker room. Like, you know, he uh, obviously is surrounded by uh, guys whose season just ended, who were deflated one step from the Super Bowl. And obviously he was feeling a little bit of that, too, maybe a little bit more mixed emotions than most of his players. But he's obviously not going to be in that locker room being like, yeah, I can't wait for the next huh. step of my life. This is the best thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> so uh, he's obviously not going to say that he's obviously respectful of the NFL tampering rules, which Giants ownership and, the, you know, obviously would want him to be considering, you know, the relationship with the commissioner's office so um he was you know a time and a place for everything and that time and a place came 12 hours later basically so uh he i thought was a guy who sat he was comfortable with the media dan is probably the number one thing i'd say never from afar you would know better than i do uh never really seemed like ben mcadoo was comfortable with the media it always felt like pulling te- you guys were pulling teeth or he was just fulfilling a league requirement to stand right. up there Shermer didn't give you much but you felt like he could have stayed when the seven minutes were over and the vikings pr person was like all right guys that's enough uh Shermer actually made a joke like oh that's all you guys got for me you don't have anything else <laughs> So and we were all like, oh, we could keep going. And even halfway through the interview, a a Minnesota Vikings reporter ran over and said, oh, I'm sorry if I missed anything. Uh, I don't want to make you repeat anything. And Shermer made a joke like, don't worry, you didn't miss anything. So he (laughs) knew he knew he wasn't given much of an answer, but he didn't he could. It seemed like he could have sat there for a half an hour and just you know, uh, replayed his greatest hits over and over of, uh, non answers. And, but he didn't mind doing it, which, right. you know, it's it probably doesn't sound like much to the fan, but I think you'll see that actually matter. It being comfortable around the media matters. Yeah. And when I noticed, I watched the video of the interview suit fit. So hopefully you know, he's back <laughs> half a Friday. It'll, it'll get him off on the right foot, you know, a little better than his predecessor did. So that's a big step. Um, yeah, I mean, he, listen, he's not going to be a guy who's electric at the podium. I think everyone, uh, kind of just knows that's his reputation. I I mean, obviously, I've gone back and watched him interviews and been paying much closer attention the last couple of weeks. He's not Rex Ryan, but that's fine. You don't need to be. Like you said, with McAdoo, it was just kind of unnecessary. He just made it such a chore, and it was adversarial, and even simple questions wouldn't get answers. And they went, now, again, this is stuff we care about way more than, obviously, the players and, and even the fans. And I, I think with the fans, it made it a lot easier to turn on McAdoo because, like, wow, this guy looks like a jerk, and he's losing. You know what I mean? He could have been the nicest yeah. guy in the world and gone 3-13. and 13. He wouldn't have had too many people getting his back, but he just made it a lot easier to jump ship because it was just – it was t- it was a tough guy to root for because he just he just really had a, a bad persona publicly. And, and I know a lot of these coaches, they don't really enjoy those, you know, five, ten minutes a day they have to deal with us, but it's part of the job. And I think Shermer – uh, the fact that you said he handled that so well, it just kind of goes with his image. I mean, he's a guy who's been in the NFL for a long time. He's had marquee roles, offensive coordinator, obviously was the head coach for the Browns for a couple of years. He knows the drill, so he handles it well. I think that's what we can expect. Again, I don't think he's going to be up there and we're going to be filling our notebooks every day with Pat Shermer at the podium, but he doesn't need to do that. I, I think he has you know, a professional personality. Uh, and I think it also speaks to how he's going to handle the locker room. You know, he's not going to go in there again. And, and I was talking to John Greco, who played for Shermer in Cleveland, who, who finished the season with the Giants. And he's not going to give general patent speeches is, is how uh, Greco described it. But that's not really necessary. I think a lot of us who probably stopped playing football in high school, maybe remember the, the crazy coaches you had there, or even in yeah. college, it happens more. It doesn't really play in the NFL. So listen, Pat Shermer is not going to turn the locker room around because of the, the motivational speeches. It's going to be because players are going to respect him 
I mean, listen, he's going to have to set some discipline uh, guidelines, which Mackey kind of struggled to do and, until things got out of hand. But uh, the thing I think is players respect Pat Trammer. His, his resume speaks for itself, especially on the offensive side of the ball. Uh, and obviously results are going to speak for it. It's a lot easier to gain respect uh, if you're winning games and, and players feel like you know what you're doing. And I think he checks those boxes. Um, so as far, before we even really get too much more into Shermer, I think we should just at least review the process a bit because, you know, we haven't done um, this podcast since, like I said, Gettleman uh, got hired. So the coaching search had you know, really just begun at that point. So, um, you know, I think, again, everyone has followed along and interviewed six candidates. I would say there's really four legitimate ones. Shermer, the Patriots coordinators, Josh McDaniels, Matt Patricia, and the Panthers defensive coordinator, Steve Wilkes, who just got hired uh, to, to take the Cardinals job. Were you surprised by that, Dan, the, the Wilkes uh, to the Cardinals? A, a little bit, but it's funny because, you know, when people talk all these plan B's and plan D's and everything else. I mean, I think Shermer was Arizona's top choice. So I think okay. they had to scramble a bit. Um, but, I, you know, hey, Wilkes interviewed like pretty much for every opening. So he clearly was a hot candidate. Uh, I think that's the guy, the Giants fans. It'll be very interesting to kind of measure him and Shermer over the next few years. Yeah. I just don't think they were getting those Patriots coordinators. So, uh, you know, whether that's a failure of the Giants or whether the Giants job is not as attractive. I mean, when you just looked at it from day one, Matt Patricia was always going to be drawn to Detroit because of the relationship with the GM there who was in New England forever. Uh, And with Josh McDaniels, the funny thing is the knock on him is, oh, you know, he's only done it with Tom Brady. Well, Andrew Luck, <laughs> Andrew Luck if he's healthy, might be the closest thing to Tom, the next Tom Brady. I mean, again, yeah. I'm not saying he will be, and, and the health is a big question mark. But if you're going to roll the dice, if you're Josh McDaniels, have already flamed out once without a quarterback, he's going to make sure he probably gets himself into the best possible situation with the quarterback. Uh, so I think that's what Indianapolis represented. So. I, said, I, I were- was a little surprised, and I, I thought they as maybe maybe I have a little bit of eagle syndrome right now. Mm-hmm. But I, I was I thought they, you know, Cardinals would want to interview D. Filippo or uh, Schwartz or Frank Reich or somebody this week. I was surprised they acted so quickly on on Wilkes. I, I I guess I would that took me a little bit aback. So yeah, I mean, D. Filippo was a guy who had a lot of buzz, and it, it never really got off the ground. I think that was a, like a hot name when you were just kind of starting to think like who could be the next guy, and, and again, he didn't. Really really get a lot of interviews. The Giants obviously didn't look at him. I think maybe he's a year away or maybe he needs to get an OC job to, to move up that ladder a bit. It's, you know, it's a bit of a jump to go from QB coach to head coach. But and as far as Schwartz, that's an interesting name to bring up too, because um, you know, I think we'll all remember the day of the season finale, Adam Schefter, who's not one to just kind of throw stuff against the wall reported not only that was Schwartz a candidate, that he was the early favorite yeah. and the Giants never even interviewed him. I think that, uh, I'm not sure what happened there. It, it's maybe there was the Giants didn't love the way that that news got out. I think that, you know, you talk about Shermer's personality. Uh, that's not Schwartz's reputation. He he kind of has a tough personality. Yeah. Uh, and I, 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 he didn't feel like you said Shermer felt like a Giants coach. Schwartz yeah. never did. So yeah. I, I'm yeah. not stunned that that didn't work out, but I'm surprised they didn't at least interview him. Hey, you brought up an interesting point, too. A minute ago, you said uh, Giants fans will probably – for the next couple of years, measure up Wilkes and Shermer. And, you know, those will be the, you know, the measuring sticks for each other, which is interesting because, you know, McAdoo's measuring stick was probably Doug Peterson for sure. since. Yeah. Yeah, and obviously <laughs> that didn't work out. So, right, right. And, got- and trust me, fans will be measuring Patricia because there was just so much smoke yeah. about him being the guy. So listen, when the Lions, you know, if they go 11 and five next year in the playoffs, people go, oh, why don't we get Matt Patricia? But I just think, you have to be realistic with, with where they were coming from and the fact that he had the relationship with Bob Quinn in, in Detroit and they have a, a franchise quarterback in his prime who's locked up long term. That's a nice – I mean, listen. The Lions like, are better than the Giants. The yeah, Lions I are mean, better. Yeah, Giants fans don't want to acknowledge that. I mean, who cares? You got four Super Bowls. The, the Giants have not been better in the last five years. And, again, that quarterback is huge. How many head coaches say after they get fired, well, I never had a quarterback. Couldn't get the – I mean, yeah. I'm not saying Matthew Stafford is Tom Brady. But it's a lot better situation to walk into an aging Eli Manning and maybe a, a Davis Webb or a, a number two pick. I mean, you know Matthew Stafford, uh, you know, is in the upper echelon quarterback. So that makes that a much more appealing job. Well, let's bring that back to Pat Shermer right there. You mentioned how many guys say they've never had a quarterback. Well, Pat Shermer's two year stint, he went nine and twenty three with the Browns. Everybody goes nine and twenty three with the Browns. <laughs> yep, <He's>, yeah, lucky. <laughs> yeah, 
his first year quarterback was Colt McCoy and his second year quarterback was Brandon Whedon. Now he drafted Brandon Whedon. So, you know, that's on him, but he, uh, you want to talk about never having a quarterback. Well, Matt Patricia is going to walk into Matt Stafford and Josh McDaniels is going to walk into Andrew Luck and Pat Shermer walked into Colt McCoy and Brandon Whedon. <laughs> right, right. That's how you, I, I have a tough time holding that whole Cleveland tenure against him. Cause I will say this, they started out, own five his second season and went five and six down the stretch. So good sign. They didn't quit on him. His first season, he came in, it was the lockout. So that's tough. First year head coach. You don't have an off season basically with your guys. It's a condensed training camp. That whole season was kind of a debacle. And then in 2012, again, he finishes on a high note. Most coaches are probably going to get a third year there, but they had changed ownership. So again, ownership is going to want to start with a new guy. So he was kind of just, you know, the odd man out there a little bit. So that, that, and you didn't hear any big problems. I, again, I talked to John Greco. There wasn't the locker room issues that really, did Maca to win because even all this season when we were you know when, when Cratch and I were talking on this podcast it was hard to believe they would really fire Ben McAdoo after an 11 and 5 playoff season in his first year but things just unraveled so drastically that they were left with no choice I mean if, if they went quietly went 5 and 11 or something Ben McAdoo is still the head coach um, but so again just relating that to Shermer with Cleveland they were just a bad team you, you, you Cole McCoy yeah. and Whedon, you're not gonna win many games um, but it wasn't like it didn't think didn't unravel there. It wasn't this disastrous tenure that's going to you know take years, I think, for McAdoo to, to even get a sniff of a head coaching job uh, because he's just going to stink of last year on him. Whereas with Shermer, I mean, listen, you just he didn't have the horses and you've seen what's happened in Cleveland uh, in the years since he left. Like, again, like a joke that nine and 23, you know, kind of looked better by the year. Yeah. the uh, When you mentioned his Cleveland tenure, two things that pop out to me. Uh, Two, and in addition to you mentioned the ownership change and the lockout. Two other things there. One, he and Colt McCoy, he put. He and Colt McCoy, there was some sort of concussion debate. Like, I think he put he put Colt McCoy back in a game with a concussion. Uh, and that's kind of what launched the NFL uh, uh, concussion protocol to a new level. So I thought that was interesting. I haven't read much on uh, that recently on Shermer and McCoy. And I think that maybe that is why he ended up pushing Brandon Whedon so hard that second season. Uh, I doubt Shermer's going to want to revisit any of that, <laughs> you know, when he's a Giants coach. But that's something I think is worth noting, like uh, that that maybe uh, came up. And then one other thing is I thought this was interesting. I think this is a good thing for Shermer. He and Joe Hayden, who was the Browns, you know, star cornerback, Um, got into it one day on the practice field, just Googling Shermer and Browns. I came up with some stuff on him and Joe Hayden getting into it on the practice field one day. So obviously, uh, you know, I wasn't at that practice, you know, uh, but clearly they got into it a little bit in front of the media. Shermer didn't back down. Again, you would know better than I do how McAdoo was uh, in terms of player confrontations. It doesn't seem he did like he did a great (laughs) job. But yeah, discipline. Yeah, so uh, I don't know the origins of that. Obviously, I don't know if anybody knows if they had a history before that day or whatnot, but clearly he and a player got into it, which you might say, oh, wow, that's that's a bad thing. He didn't get along with his players. No, that was the only indication of it. And when it when something popped up, it didn't seem like he didn't get along with his players. It seems like his players respected him and probably respected him even more after that day. Right, and we, we, I think we both spoke uh, spoke to Mary Kay Cabot, who's the great uh, Browns beat reporter, and she gave, she said that they were fine after that too. So it wasn't yeah. something that lingered and it poisoned the locker room again. I mean, yeah, coaches have to do that. That's one of the things that always just kind of blew me away with McAdoo is just kind of the lack. Hey, he was such a player's coach. I mean, guys are getting to fights in practice. I know that happens. Bill Belichick has a rule. You get in a fight in practice, you're gone. Like, just doesn't matter who yeah. started it. doesn't matter who threw the first punch. You're both gone. And there would be melees going on at the giant training camp day after day. And again, some of that's, hey, boys will be boys. Some of that's football. But it also, it's A, it doesn't send a great message that your teammates are, you know, literally the throwing hands. It wasn't just like the pushing and shoving. And also, it disrupts practice. You only have so much time on the on the field with the CBA and everything else. So if you're letting guys just, you know, have 12-round bouts, you're, 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 that's five plays you didn't get to yeah. run with Davis Webb or, you know, whatever. So I think that, uh, you know, not to make too much, of course, we weren't there for the Shermer Hayden thing, but just yeah. any coach has to have a little bit of a discipline streak. Yeah. So again, even that little anecdote uh, it speaks to that because again, that is probably the question mark because he's just not a sexy hire. You can't. There's no way around that. I mean, yeah. I always make jokes about guys' names. Just some Pat Shermer just doesn't doesn't jump <laughs> off the marquee yet. I'm not gonna. I mean, I'm telling you, people will not spell his name right for his entire giant tenure. You'll see yeah. er. You'll see. It'll, it'll be it'll be botched forever. Um, and again, well, it was Cleveland Browns tenure. I mean, nothing there jumps out. He is this guy's gonna be a, a great head coach in in New York City, but. 
Um, I just think it's a solid hire. That, and again, if you got Matt Patricia and Josh McDaniels, maybe the ceiling would be higher because they kind of get these young guys who came from the, the Belichick tree. Maybe they're the guys who would finally be able to duplicate that success. Shermer doesn't have all that that sizzle, but I just think he, I think he's just a solid guy. Uh, and I think he will come in and just kind of restore some order. And, and, and that's what this franchise you know, kind of desperately needs. I, what I liked about him was this. And listen, I started the first week of January. So for me to have had any actual insights into the coaching hire uh, was probably, you know, I, I didn't. So but from from a guy who follows the team and a guy who, uh, you know, knows football, I, I liked Shermer as a hire for the Giants for this reason. The number one issue, and I'm sure we'll get into it, facing the Giants this offseason is what are they doing at quarterback? Is it Eli Manning? Is it Davis Webb? Is it the number two pick? Is it all three guys on the roster next year? I, th- I think it probably is. I think it's probably going to be all three of them on the roster next right. year. So and then that if that's the case. And we're going to be guilty of this. You know, we're going to make it we're going to make it. I'm about to make it seem like it's a bad thing, but we're going to be the ones making it a bad thing is there's going to be questions every day. Like, who's the number two guy on the roster? Who is he gaining number? Is he gaining on the number one guy? Is the number three guy gaining on the number two guy who is inactive for the first game? Like, it's all going to be that kind of quarterback headache dilemma and you need and Pat Shermer's number one thing is he's a quarterback guru right he's he's Donovan McNabb's coach he it was Sam Bradford rookie of the year under him he you know had this reclamation project with Case Keenum Nick Foles was had 27 touchdowns and two interceptions in 2013 with Shermer as OC and Chip Kelly's offense so he's got this extensive quarterback resume so if Matt Patricia was the hire and Matt I've heard great things about Matt Patricia I know somebody who knows Matt Patricia well says he is a great he's he's, he's going to be as close to Belichick in terms of running a program as possible so um well I don't know how it'll be on game days but you know is he so? But Patricia was going to need to hire some Shermer type guy to be right. his offensive coordinator. So you were going to put a lot of expectation on that offensive coordinator. He was basically going to have to be associate head coach. So uh, to me, I think may, hiring a quarterback guy for the Giants made sense. Whether his last name is Shermer or Smith or whether he was a head coach before or not, I thought you needed somebody who's going to know how to handle that quarterback room. And that's why, to me, I thought it was a smart hire. Right. Well, I guess the one thing I'll throw into that, if listen, if you were hiring him for quarterbacks, coach or offensive coordinator, it would be a, not even a home run. It'd be a grand slam because, again, his track record is phenomenal there. He is going to be the head coach. So how much time will he be able to spend in that quarterback room? I mean, I think, you know, I think Mike Garofalo said on NFL Network that uh, he's leaning towards calling the plays. I mean, listen, I think everyone around the Giants is a little scarred from from Ben McAdoo's face being buried in the diner sheet and uh, kind of not not having a full grasp on the team. But there are there are plenty of head coaches who call plays and have success. So I uh, can't rule that out as being uh, a good thing. Because again, listen, that's why he got the job because of his ability as you know an offensive mind and then specifically as a play caller. But I don't know that he'll be able to. You know, if they have the number two pick, is he going to be able to really spend a ton of time grooming that kid behind the scenes when he's also going to be getting ready Eli Manning to play the yeah. Eagles and getting ready to play the Cowboys? So I think that will be interesting how he fills out his staff on the offensive side of the ball because if he's going to call the plays like in Cleveland. He didn't even have an offensive coordinator the first year. That's a terrible idea. That was a a terrible. That was way too much on his plate. And and to his credit, he recognized that, brought in a veteran guy in Brad Childress in 2012. And my understanding is they kind of collaborated on the play calling. I don't think that he totally seeded it, but I also don't think he was the only guy calling it. It was a little more of a collaborative, whereas with McAdoo, it was McAdoo called it, and then he handed it to Sullivan. There was really no uh, collaboration there. Um, So I would think he'll at least hire an offensive coordinator. But now if he's going to call the plays, I think he can – take more of a, I don't want to say a risk, but he can maybe, you know, get an up and coming young guy who isn't going to be tasked with the responsibility uh, of calling the plays. And, you know, a guy like Di Filippo would be a great hire. I don't know if they'd be able to pry him away from Philly. And the other problem with a guy like that, you might get him for one year and then he's gone yeah. uh, next year to head coaching job. But hey, listen, you, you deal with that down the road if that happens. And again, I'm not saying, um, you know, Di Filippo is a candidate because, uh, you know, there, there's no real direct ties there to Shermer, but he's certainly I would think he's on every head coach's radar yeah. uh, for a potential OC job. Um, and then you're going to hire a quarterback's coach, too. So those, those hires are going to be important to deal with these guys. Uh, but I think the most important hires for Shermer, uh, or the most important was going to be a defensive coordinator, because obviously he has the offensive background. You trust that that's in good hands. 
Uh, and we already have a report again how these things work. I mean, the order is always out of whack because, hey, Shermer wasn't even hired when there's already reports that uh, <laughs> Thomas McGay, he's going to be a special teams coordinator. He's He was with the Panthers the last two years, so very familiar with Dave Gettleman. He was also with the Giants from 07 to, I think, 10 or 11. So he has familiarity, uh, you know, with the Giants. So he, he made a lot of sense. Um, I'm sure Shermer maybe knew of him or just signed off on him if, if Gettleman and Mara and everyone recommended him. Sure. I mean, I mean, special teams coordinator is not brain surgery, although Tom Quinn might have made it seem like that. Um, <laughs> but defense coordinator, uh, the reports that Jack Del Rio, I mean, that's a guy I thought might have got looks for head coaching open the opening. So I think that's uh, if nothing else. That is a marquee. Hire. That's a big hire. That's a big name. Everyone knows Jack Del Rio. So what are your thoughts? On Del Rio, because, again, I think that might be the most important hire on, on Shermer's staff, that defensive coordinator. Yeah, if that's him, I, yeah, I'm with you 100% there, Dan. I think I thought Del Rio was a guy not necessarily for the Giants job uh, would be a head coaching candidate, but some of the ones that opened later, uh, the Cardinals obviously was still open until uh, this week. The Titans opened after the play, after the divisional round. So that was a guy I thought, oh, maybe Del Rio ends up there. I kind of thought he got a raw deal. Again, I'm not in Oakland or Vegas or wherever the Raiders or L.A. or wherever they play, um, but uh I'm not there, but I kind of thought from afar he got a raw deal. I mean, you're talking about a guy who went, I think they went 12 and four last year. Four, and the quarterback gets hurt. They might have, you know, they might have made a run to the Super Bowl for all you yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. And you're playing with that. And then this year they go six and 10. Um, kind of, I think, I think I want to say they had more injuries again this year like the, that kind of derailed that team. Like, um, and the NFC and the AFC West was extremely competitive, right? The Chargers were good. The Chiefs were, they were all like around nine and seven. So like, I just thought he kind of got a raw deal. They, and listen, sometimes a team knows who they want and they make a move. Like if you're the Raiders, you've always wanted John Gruden back. You feel like he got away from you the first time, uh, cost you a Super Bowl. Um, uh, so you go out and give him a 10 year deal for a hundred million dollars. I mean, that's how bad you want him. That's not. That, that's more wanting to hire John Gruden than it is wanting to fire Jack Del Rio. Right. If, they, if they didn't think they could get John Gruden, Jack Del Rio is still the coach of the Raiders. Hey, there you go. That's the perfect way to say it. So you're basically getting a guy who's head coach quality to be your defensive coordinator, and you're an offensive guy. I think that's a per, that's a perfect match. I, again, I got to do some homework there as how they possibly know each other and whatnot. But um, maybe they don't. You know what? Better for you know what? If Shermer doesn't know him, then credit to him for not just staying with what's familiar and staying in his coaching tree, which is which, a, mis- a mistake I think a lot of coaches make. And everyone was afraid it was going to happen with Spags because, I mean, listen, yeah. that was uh, – I would, I would call it informed speculation that yeah. the fact that Spags was still hanging around, the fact that he's beloved by the Giants' ownership, you know, obviously was here when uh, – Gettleman was here when Spags was here. Uh, it made a ton of sense because obviously Spags, when he got the head coaching job in St. Louis, who was his offensive coordinator? Pat Shermer. They worked together for like eight or nine years on Andy Reid's staff, broke in together in Philadelphia. So it made a ton of sense. And I think it, the, the Shermer hire would have been so much – it would have been such a sour note to come in and then keep yeah. Spags, who just had you yeah. know the worst defense in the NFL. So yeah. I give credit if, if in fact he is going to go outside and maybe he doesn't know Del Rio as far as being on staff with them. But I'm sure you know those guys have been around the NFL, they've they've met each other at the combine or the Senior yeah. Bowl or whatnot, and, and have some relationship. But I think that is a great point that the idea of keeping Spags it would have just gone flown in the face yeah. of this whole you know rebuild or or uh, you know John Marin won the wholesale changes if you, if you just kept the defensive coordinator who oversaw a debacle is that would have been a bad message to send two two things here one uh i talked to a player who played for del rio in the past and i asked him a little bit about the defense and here's what he said in terms of uh how they play because the number one thing i like giants fans will get to know that this about me i pay a lot of attention to secondary play maybe it's because Rutgers always had good defensive backs when i covered them uh deron Harmon and mccordy and those guys logan ryan but i pay a lot of attention maybe it's because i dreamed of being a uh a defensive back i don't know uh but uh i asked about secondary play and i said what do you, what does Del Rio like to do? And the guy said, depends on the call in the back end, but uh, once a formation comes out we, and we don't like the call, we already had some uh, check to a different call in mind. So we were already planned for certain situations, depending on what the offense did. 
we like to we like zone and we also mixed in some man pressures on third down. So take that for what it is. It's from a player. It's kind of generic, but at least it gives you a little bit of an idea. They'll play some zone. They'll mix in some man pressures if Del Rio is actually the guy. But I, the second thing, Dan, I wanted I don't know. You want to do true. I, I haven't read this anywhere. It's just a thought that popped into my mind as you were talking. Um, so I don't know. This, you want to just give me a one word true false or you want to guess or uh, whatever. Any chance, remember, Shermer was the Eagles offensive coordinator, 13 to 15. And then Chip Kelly got fired and he took a position coach job as the Vikings tight ends coach, I believe. He wasn't right. the offensive coordinator right away. He got right. promoted. promoted. So obviously head coaches do go not just from – uh, head coach to coordinator, but back to position coach. So I assume coordinators can go from position coaches to it without it being too much of an ego hit. Any chance he keeps Spags as a position coach? Ah, that's not a crazy thought, you know. I mean, because you know, Spags again. You, you mentioned how these coaches have to kind of go down different roads. I mean, hey, listen, having a job is better than not having one at all. Yeah. And and you kind of have to build yourself back up a little bit. Because I'm trying to think now, Spags when after he left St. Louis. He went to the Saints as the defensive coordinator for one year, and then he went to the Ravens as the senior defensive assistant, which exactly. is strictly a keep your foot, you know, keep your, you know, keep yourself in the game type yeah. of job. And then he was a secondary coach for a year, and then you got yeah, I, I don't think that's crazy. It might be tough to do it here though, only because of your history. It might be easier yeah. to go be the defensive backs coach in Jacksonville or something yeah. because yeah. here it's like you know it's the guy, demotion. yeah, and then you're you're answering to the guy who took your job. And let alone that, I mean, he finished as the interim coach. Technically, Shermer took a job. So, I mean, yeah. listen, these guys all have egos. I mean, I think Spag is a pretty good guy. But that I, I don't think it's crazy, but I, I think I have a hard time seeing that happen. I mean, but, hey, listen, if, if he's willing to swallow his pride and, again, he doesn't have to move and, and obviously he likes the area and, and likes the Giants organization, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't totally rule it out. But uh, it, it seems seems a little far-fetched. Uh, and one last note on Del Rio, too, as you're talking about kind of – getting into the X's and O's. I didn't know we were doing that on uh, on January 23rd. There, Ryan. <laughs> but uh, he plays a 4-3. He's always been a 4-3 guy. Um, you know, I think it's some versatility. He had, you know, Khalil Mack and guys who could either, you know, put a hand in the dirt or stand up. But the 4-3 fits what the Giants have run here. So that makes sense because you brought a 3-4 guy in. You're making this rebuild that much more complicated because you're going to be switching guys around and, and making, you know, changes. They don't have linebackers to run a 4-3. You're going to add another linebacker to the mix. That'd be tough. So uh, I think that's a fit because – the, you know, the Oakland defense wasn't great the last couple of years, but I mean, Del Rio was the head coach. So I think you have to go a little bit back to more his coordinator days. And when he was in Denver before he got the Oakland job, uh, you know, he had a very good defense there. Obviously had a lot of talent, um, but hey, coaches get the credit when the talent uh, produces and, you know, they made a Super Bowl. So, uh, but that, just that 4-3 stuck out to me is that that's a fit. That makes sense. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, they have the pieces for 4-3. So I think you can kind of just, just keep rolling with that. Uh, I think we can probably wrap up a little bit here with just um, an update kind of on where, what, what kind of comes next for Shermer because he's hitting the ground running. Um, he was supposed to fly to New Jersey, I believe, Monday night, and a blizzard hit Minnesota, which is something I'm I'm happy to hear as, as I'm about to head out there next week for the Super Bowl, so that'll, that'll be fun <laughs> to deal with. But uh, maybe it got out of the system this week. But anyways, he was supposed to fly to New Jersey, and the expectation, I believe, was that he would have an introductory press conference probably Tuesday morning and then hop right on a flight uh, to Mobile, Alabama for the Senior Bowl. Uh, plans changed due to the storm. So uh, my understanding is he's flying directly to Mobile on Tuesday. We'll be down there for practices Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, and the Senior Bowl is going to be important. Uh, I know you, you highlighted a few guys the Giants can can take a look at down there. I mean, obviously the quarterbacks, Baker Mayfield and Josh Allen are, are sort of the headline guys. But Again, as you noted in that piece, they, they don't just have the second pick in the draft. They have a you know a top pick in you know every round, and this team has a lot of holes to fill. So um, there's a lot of scouting that's going to take place. Uh, and then Shermer comes back on Friday for his you know actual introductory press conference. But uh, it's going to be a busy week. I mean, he has to hit the ground running here, and and, and he probably won't stop um, you know for for a long while, maybe until that kind of break coaches get in July, because there's there's a lot ahead of him. Mm -hmm. uh, so what, what, when you look at you know what is ahead of him. And you can feel free to steal from my piece I put up this morning uh, on his top priorities. But what, what stands out to you uh, as some of the things you know, he needs to do in these first, you know, week, two weeks, a month, whatever you want to set the timeline, but just kind of the top priorities for, for him as the new head coach? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would let's just talk the first few days. I mean, 
even a week seems long to uh, I, th- I think I remember when Gettleman was hired, he came in and it was like, have you talked to Eli Apple yet? And it was like, not yet. And it was like, have you talked to uh, Eli, Manning? Uh, Eli Manning yet? No, and it was what? like, no, not, no, not yet. And uh, I get it. Like he had, he's the general manager. He had a lot of other, he didn't even, you know, he didn't even have a coach. So uh, at least a full-time coach. Right. So he had a lot noted. of, he, he knocked all those things out pretty quick though. Cause yes. you can't, you can't, you can't let things linger. Cause uh, yes. you know, there's person is involved. There's feelings involved. So you don't want to make a guy feel like he's not a priority. So he did kind of knock all those, those checked all those boxes pretty quickly. And I, I would think Shermer has to check them even quicker. Like yeah. I would, like if he's done with us by one o'clock Friday, I would, if I was him, I'd probably be driving to Eli Apple's house, uh, <laughs> you know, one fifteen, Uh, and then I'd probably go to Eli Manning's house after that. I'd probably do a tour to New Jersey. Um, <laughs> I would get in front of these guys as quickly as possible and figure out, um, if our personalities mesh, you know, just kind of, what happened here last year? I don't want to spend a lot of time. If I'm him, I'm saying I don't want to spend a lot of time on last year. But what happened here last year? Like, why didn't this work out for you? Um, and here's how we're going to change that. So I would pick five, six players, Manning, Apple at the top of the list. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe Landon Collins. Uh, get on the phone with that wide receiver out in L.A. Yes, Odell Beckham. <laughs> uh, how are you feeling? Yes. I mean, obviously, Odell was the first one to, like, kind of express his excitement about uh Shermer's hire uh so clearly he's on board but um I would find four or five players that would be the first thing I did uh there's been reports we should address this that Shermer actually has a coaching staff in place I asked him that after the game he said no comment he didn't say no that's crazy he (laughs) said he said no comment so maybe he really does have most of his coaching staff in place which would give him uh, I th- I think would give would launch him far ahead in the process. You know, I, yeah. I I would if he already has that even ninety percent done, then he can really get to work on the roster and on the draft, which are probably the two things that where I would prioritize. Yeah, I'll just jump in on the coaching staff. That's why I thought it was kind of funny the hand wringing. Oh, I hope he doesn't make the Super Bowl because that's two more. I mean, it's two more weeks. I mean, it wouldn't have made a difference. He's he's not gonna you know sit down the day after the season ends and go, oh boy, I gotta figure out who's gonna be my linebackers coach. I mean, these guys. I mean, especially you, you know you've been in the college world and I was there. The ads always make that reference. They always have a a list in their top draw. So if the you know, coaches can leave at the you know blink of an eye, and you have to have yeah. uh, that that next crop of candidates lined up. Pat Shermer has been. I promise you has been planning to get back to this position since the day he was fired by Cleveland in 2012. And as the years goes on, you start to develop relationships, you see guys. And I promise he has a, you know, he, every candidate, you know, every position probably has three candidates and maybe he can't, yeah. you know, maybe John D. Filippo is his number one coordinator uh, desire and he can't get him. But you would think he has guys lined up. He said casual conversations throughout the years. Hey, like my name's coming up here. Would you be interested in coming along being my offensive line coach? That type of thing. Guy, guy like him who's been around so long. It's an even easier process like Steve Wilkes or something like that. It might be more difficult because you don't have a ton of different places to pull from or even Patricia yeah. McDaniels. They're not going to be able to raid Belichick staff. So it might be a little tougher for them. I think Shermer has you know, such a wide network that uh, he will have those positions filled up too much of a problem. But again, I think that's why it was a little silly to to worry about whether or not the Vikings made it. I mean, you wouldn't you wouldn't have lost a lot in that time because sure, coaches are getting snatched up, but odds are. There are coaches just sitting there waiting for the official well, go ahead from Shermer. I mean, you, you wrote it in your special teams coordinator story, right? Didn't didn't the Giants uh, McGahey? How do I pronounce this? I think that's, no, that's I'm going he, with until told otherwise. Yeah, yeah. So uh, didn't he basically turn down an interview in Cleveland? Yeah. Right. <laughs> so I mean, that I mean, you want to believe that he doesn't already know he's the Giants. You don't that's turn a down a job. I don't think it. T- this isn't being a football coach. You're being a media guy. Uh, you could be any. You could have any job in America. You, you right now, as you're driving down Route 80, listening to us, ask yourself: Do you turn down a job before you know you already have <laughs> another job? Like, right. Yeah, no, that's 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 certainly the case. Again, that's well, I think a lot of the stuff it's kind of silly. Where you, and I understand why you can't officially announce stuff, but I mean, again, it's a, it's a little bit silly because uh, again, these things are in place. A lot of handshake deals and a lot of phone calls. There's no there's no rules like preventing that type of stuff. Um, but yeah, so I think we have covered quite a bit here for the the first episode of the the sort of new iteration of the Talk Is Cheap podcast. It's been 
great having you uh, alongside here, Ryan. I think we're going to have a lot of fun over the next couple of months, seasons, however long this, this rolls on. But <laughs> If uh, it's only a couple of months, something went wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just okay, – like Pat Shermer, I'm just small goals, just keeping my eyes focused on what's ahead of There's me. There's a time and a place. Exactly, exactly. But, yeah, no, great job. And, um, you know, we'll try and keep these podcasts coming through the off season. Hard to say a set schedule because some weeks there won't be much news. Some weeks there might be a lot. So we'll just be kind of kind of flexible with that. But we'll certainly – uh, you know, keep them coming throughout the off season. I mean, the combine's only a month away, and I would assume we'll have uh, an episode or two between now and then. Uh, but, but until then, just want to say thanks to everyone for listening. You know, you can catch this podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, you know, everywhere else you can find podcasts, and we'll catch you next time. <laughs> <laughs>